Now, we've got Paul and Angela here. We've been thinking all week about this question, life, uh, what if there's more? And um, we've considered life to the full back on Tuesday night, um, and uh, then how can we get the most out of life, and then the origins of life on Wednesday night, can I believe in God? And then on Thursday evening, uh, we were thinking about broken life. And this morning, we have this question, uh, the only way to life with so many options, how can I choose? We got Paul and Angela with us. Um, uh, Angela um, grew up here in the United Kingdom. Uh, she, her parents came across as uh, the first boat people. Some of the old amongst us will remember back in the nine, late 70s, uh, the Vietnamese boat people, and her parents landed in Bournemouth with simply the clothes they stood in. Uh, Angela ended up studying law at Cambridge and then went on to be a... Uh, a, a, a lawyer at Linklater's, where she met Paul. And uh, Paul's background, very different, growing up in Singapore and then working in Linklater's um, in market capitalizations and uh, bringing companies through to listing on the London Stock Exchange. So it's, gr it's great to have you both with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Angela, having heard just that little synopsis of um, your parents arriving with just the clothes that they they stood in, there in Bournemouth in a warehouse. So it just gave us a sense of the from A to B, as it were, how, how you ended up at Robinson College and studying law in Cambridge. Yeah, I guess to understand my background, you, you kind of need to understand my parents. They both came from wealthy Chinese families, but ended up with nothing as they grew up. Um, my mum was actually born in Cambodia um, during the Khmer Rouge. And they fled, went to Vietnam, met a, the communist government after the Vietnam War, and, but also my dad. Uh, but they decided to flee again for a better life for themselves. So they encountered a lot of hardship along the way. They found themselves on a boat that was filling with water and was miraculously rescued as a British cargo ship was passing by on its way to Japan. So I grew up with that as my backdrop. Um, and teaching that you need to actively work your way to a better future for yourself. Um, so my sister and I studied really hard, knowing that our parents didn't get a chance to go to school and I guess the hardworking you know, attitude just continued from that. Thank you very much, Angela. And I remember you saying that your whole family had to club together when they were back out in Cambodia to put money into the boat, as it were, which then ended up sinking. Yes, they paid a, the, the price of a house, you know, to get onto a boat that they crouched in with people on top of them for three days. Yeah, yeah. Now, Paul, your um, pathway or journey is very, very different. Your background, a very different story. Just tell us a bit about, um, uh, about your story and your parents and so forth growing up in Singapore. My father is sitting here, so I better be careful, be careful what I say. Uh, but yes, I grew up in, in circumstances that are, that are very different from, from Angela's. I, I grew up in Singapore. Uh, my parents uh, were educated. In fact, my mother is still better educated than I am. Uh, and they both worked very hard to provide for, for me growing up. I'm the only child, and there wasn't a, a time in my life that I, that I ever knew need. In fact, um, most people would say I grew up in very privileged circumstances. People know Singapore from the film Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, I'd recommend the book. It's a much better, it's a, it's a great read. It captures that slice of Singaporean society very, very well. Uh, and I, I grew up in those circles. I'm, I'm not a crazy rich Asian. Some people think my mother's family might be, but I grew I, I went to the school in the book. I went to the church in the book. Those were- Sounds those were pretty close. And you ended up studying law in Cambridge. I mean, you're, right. you're beginning to sound, you're, you're painting a picture, if I might put it like that. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so those are, you know, the circumstances I grew up in, or spoiled, as my father would, would say. You can ask him about that. Who, who spoiled me? Anyway, yeah. well, yeah. well look, now Angela, um, just, you know, here we are sitting in a church, you're about to talk about, you know, your understanding of the Lord Jesus. So what was your understanding of Jesus as you were growing up in that, uh, that background? I think similar to a lot of other British-born Chinese BBCs, um, I had a cocktail of Chinese beliefs. 
So um, at home, we would have an altar um, that we would burn incense on and offer food to family members that have passed away to remember them. I remember planning my driving exam on a specific time, a specific hour, according to the div Chinese divination calendar, what, when it was a lucky time to take driving exams. And, and you passed? And I passed first time. <laughs> <laughs> should, should, should we, you know, should, should we be a little nervous if we bump into you uh, at the wheel of your car? Better check the calendar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and I was also, um, my grand auntie helped to raise me growing up. And she was a devout Buddhist for most of her life. So on the 1st and the 15th of every month, I would not eat meat or so-called pungent vegetables in an attempt to moderate and, and have exercise self-control. So, but yes, I didn't, I didn't know very much about Jesus growing up. I only heard about him through films and TV, which wasn't really very positive. And for the longest time, I didn't realize he was a man. I just thought he was a swear word, which I'd heard a lot. Mm. Um, mm. I definitely didn't think he was real. I thought that he was something that society had created quite well to help people the mm. way that my family rituals help my family. And Paul, what about you in the Methodist crazy rich Asian church? <laughs> the, I, I was exposed to Jesus from a very young age. I don't think I can remember a Sunday where my mother didn't bring me to church. Uh, so I, I, I called myself a Christian from a very young age. But the Christianity I grew up with, I think it was very clear that Jesus was savior. He, he saved me from God's judgment and hell, uh, which of course he does. But I don't think it was so clear to me about that, that, that Jesus had any impact on the rest of my life, that he was my king, uh, and that my, you know, my heart's desires and priorities and ambitions should be shaped around his. The result was that I grew up with a, a label that said Christian on me, mm. but the reality was that during the rest of the week, the things that I wanted, the things that I chased after, uh, were just the same as my peers in school uh, at a, and at work. Um, so um, now, here you are working just up the road at Linklater's, uh, probably unearthly hours and all the rest of it. Yeah. T tell us what happened to bring about change. That's right. So I th one, one of my colleagues, I think that maybe they could see that I was living this sort of hypocritical life with a, with a Christian label, but not really a Christian heart, as it were, not really following Jesus. And they said to me, look, you're working so hard. On Sundays, you go to church after the office. Just go up the, just go up, just go to this church up the road. It's much closer. And so I did. And in, in God's kindness, uh, I remember coming here on, on a Sunday and remembering thinking, Gosh, the people here take uh, the Bible and take what Jesus says really seriously, uh, and they're really intelligent. Uh, that, that always attractive. That's always attractive to a lawyer. Um, and so you, I, I just you must, must have met the right people. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how that. Yeah, uh, I, I remember who preached. It wasn't you, William. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. So I, I just kept coming along, and I, and I studied the Bible to, um, in, in studied Mark's Gospel, and I, I came to this this part of Mark's Gospel, which where Jesus defines what a Christian is, and definitions are, are very important to lawyers. And I thought, okay, definition here. Let's pay attention. And Jesus says, uh, a Christian is someone who follows him, who, whoever wants to come after him must deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. And I thought, gosh, if this is the definition of what a Christian is, then, then I don't fit. Because uh, I'd never denied myself anything for the sake of Jesus or the gospel before. And that, that was quite a, quite a shocking moment for me. And I realized at that point, oh gosh, something needs to, something needs to change here. Uh, and so my, I reworked my priorities or God reworked my priorities in my heart. Uh, around his, and wonderfully offered me a, a better life, as it were, a tr true life, as we've been talking about all of, all of this week, uh, something that, that is wonderful to, to know him and to follow him and to be known by him. And what about you, Angela? How did you come to, to be sitting here, as it were? I can't believe I'm sitting here, by the way. <laughs> but um, I guess I also met Christians at work, and I was surprised that they believed in all the things in the Bible, um, not as fairy tales, but as history. Um, but I was more surprised to find out that they could give me reasons for why they believe them. And that challenged me because I don't think I had many reasons for the things that I believed growing up. I just was so familiar to them that I never questioned whether they were not, whether or not they were historically true. 
Um, so I was invited to Christianity Explored, um, and then the Bible studies here and the Gospel of Mark. And I was just fascinated when I started reading. Um, intellectually, at first, as a lawyer, um, another thing that lawyers really appreciate is consistency through the document. And when I was reading the Bible, I was just amazed to see how this giant you know, compilation of books written by different people at different times was consistently talking about one person. It was, it was very hard to make up. Um, and as a person of another faith, I was also surprised that this person that I never knew all my life understood so much about me, mm. my thoughts, mm. um, and could explain the world and the problems with it. Mm. And having grown up in a, a Confucian, Buddhist, Taoist, ancestor worship, that kind of background, what, what would you say to the question, you know, with so many options, how can I choose? What is unique about the Lord Jesus? I think the, the thing that is unique about the Christian faith is this idea of grace. Um, the idea that you can get something that you didn't work for or not get something that you justly deserve because to me, growing up, karma made a lot more sense. You know, cause and effect. You do good, you work hard, you will be rewarded. And I saw that in my parents' life with the, what, all the work they did to build themselves a better life. Um, and so I, I thought that's what you should do. You control your destiny um, and you've got to make it happen, whether it's by working hard, thinking positively or superstition, touching on some wood or something. But... Um, the grace that I found in Christianity said that whilst I was rejecting Jesus and was his enemy, he decided to die for me on a cross to forgive me. And actually, I found that quite offensive as well. Um, Why did you find it offensive? Because if you, if you spend your whole life trying to be good, mm. which I thought I was, then you've been told that actually you're not good enough because God's standards are just much higher and do you not recognize that you have caused harm in other ways? But mm. the biggest harm you've caused is rejecting God. I didn't, I didn't understand that. I didn't think that was a big deal until I thought about my own parents and how hurt they would feel if I decided that I, wouldn't, I would ignore them for the rest of my life despite all the love and sacrifice they had shown me. Well, why should I be included in the inheritance if I'm not even going to recognize you? Mm. So that, that's so different because every other faith says to you, or all the faith that I've been a part of says that you are the engine to your success or failure and nobody else is to blame. But Christianity said that Christ is the only giver of life and you can't compete with his work. But because of that, nobody is barred from entry. Mm -hmm. Everyone is welcome. And I haven't seen that anywhere else. Thank you very much indeed, Angela. Just one final question for you, Paul. Uh, in a nutshell, if you had to express, you know, what is the Christian faith? In, just in a nutshell, uh, not a lawyer's nutshell. You know, we don't want, don't want, we're not paying by the word here. So, <laughs> um, for me, it's it's what we've been talking about all week this week. Jesus offers you life, uh, true life, not life as the rest of the world defines it. You know, living for the here and now, working for the next holiday. He wants to show you what it truly means to live as a human being, and then offers you eternal life as well, freedom from God's judgment at that rebellion that Angela was talking about, but also real eternal life in, in a world that he remakes without sin or suffering and death anymore. That's, that's what true Christianity is to me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you both so much for being prepared to be interviewed like this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will also take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else, believe on account of the works themselves. A number of years ago, we had the joy of spending Christmas in Sydney, Australia, and we were staying at a friend's house near the beach at Balmoral. On the evening, on Christmas evening, we went down to the beach, as you do, and we took a barbecue with us, and of course, we cooked prawns and uh, celebrated with a can of Foster's. Of course, you had to do it. You were in Sydney on Christmas Day. It's been said of the Australians that they worship the good life with good reason. For a secularist with no external object of devotion other than this world, Sydney, Australia must be paradise. On a similar trip down under a few years earlier, I had returned from Sydney via Dhaka in Bangladesh. Landing in Dhaka, it was the time of Dirga Puja, and there people were worshipping the multi-breasted goddess Dirga, and she was being paraded through the streets with mass crowds thronging the procession. It just happened that year that the Hindu festival of Dirga Puja coincided with the Muslim festival of Eid. And even as the goddess Durga was held aloft, other streets were literally, literally running red with blood as worshippers slaughtered bulls for themselves, and additional animals were being slaughtered for their friends in London who had paid to have them sacrifice on their behalf. And then, of course, flying back to England, you land in Heathrow, and in London we find every one of these subjects of human worship cheek by jowl, side by side, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, secularist, Muslim, Christian, Zoroastrian, animist, pagan. Well, our issue this morning, as it has been all week, is life. And we're asking the question, the only way to life with so many options, how can I choose? I want to say it's a great question. You know, the Buddhists suggest the Eightfold Path, the Hindu, the Endless Cycle of Karma, the Muslim, the Five Pillars, the Sikh, the Guru, the Christian, Jesus Christ, the secularist, eat, drink, and be merry. What I want us to do is to look, as we have done all week, at this record of Jesus' teaching, but tonight I want us to zero in particularly on the night before, uh, sorry, this, this morning I want to zero in particularly on the night before Jesus died. It is a scene of extraordinary intimacy. Jesus is with his 11 disciples. He knows he's going to be nailed to the cross within hours. One disciple, Judas, has already betrayed and left. And now he teaches his disciples about life when he is gone. And we are pitched into a series of questions from Jesus' bewildered disciples. So Peter asks first, why can't I go with you? And then Thomas asks, well, how can we know the way? And then Philip demands, just show us the Father, will you? And what I want us to do is to explore the essential offer of Jesus the exclusive claim of Jesus, and the evidence-based appeal of Jesus, the essential offer. We can see this in verses 1 to 4 of our reading. It's an offer of life, both now, today, and in the future. And verses 1 to 3 fame, frame the offer in the starkest of terms. Some of us will be familiar with these sentences from funerals we may have attended. 
chapter 14, verse 1. We're on page 43. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, the promise of Jesus here is always key, but it has been acutely relevant in the last couple of years. Jesus explains that he's going back to his father and that he is going via the cross, that's implicit, in order to prepare a place for each of his followers. He makes it clear that there's plenty of room with the father, many rooms. He assures his disciples that he will return and that he will take those who follow him to be with him in this future life forever. The offer is concrete. There's a real place, a real home, a real future. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Some have this view of Jesus that it's all kind of rather airy-fairy and wishy-washy and disembodied and ethereal, you know, people in nighties sitting on clouds playing harps and all this sort of stuff. No, this is really concrete. In my Father's house are many rooms. The offer is also communal or corporate. In each case, the you is a second person plural. So Peter has asked the question, if it were not so, would I have told you, plural? And it's very specific. He is going. He's going to the cross. His departure is via his death and resurrection. He's going to his Father in heaven. When we pause and explore it even further, the image is beautifully relational. The word dwelling places, uh, one translation has dwelling places, another rooms, another has mansions. But the picture is not so much of multiple separate estates, sorry if you were hoping for Downton Abbey, as of one united family. In my father's house are many dwelling places. There's plenty of room. It's a promise of life now belonging to God and life beyond in the presence of God. And there is real assurance here, membership, Confidence and certainty, acceptance by the Father, a promise for those who follow Jesus, a sure and certain future. Now, over the last 24 months, like you, I have attended more funerals than I'd like to mention. And may I say that this teaching has become acutely relevant. It always is relevant but acutely so. And I say there is something unutterably bleak about going to a secularist funeral. I always uh, comes inherited from my grandfather a determination that I have to be there an hour before any event. So I always turn up very early for a funeral. And that means I usually hear two services before the one I'm going to take at the crematorium. And may I say there is something unutterably bleak, banal, vacuous about the promises made at those events. And Jesus, he offers us concrete assurance, absolute certainty. Uh, Peter has said, look, look, how can we know that, uh, that I'll lay down my life for you? Uh, why can't I come with you? And Jesus responds, let not your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many rooms. So the stakes are incredibly high. Jeremy Clarkson, just before Easter, reflecting on his own death, I turn 62 tomorrow, which means death cannot be far away. I do think about dying a lot. It bothers me. Ah, oh, you say, but you haven't yet answered the question. I mean, the question is the only way to life. With so many options, how can I choose? Q, Thomas, there in verse 5. Thomas said to him, 
Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, there's no getting away from the fact that this claim is exclusive. And I know that is not a popular idea. Do remember that what Jesus says here would not have been popular at all in his time either. He says it in Jerusalem to a group of Jews at Passover time, the major festival. And it's never been popular in any age. But when the stakes are so high, verses 1 to 4, surely it's not what everybody else thinks or what is or is not popular that matters. Surely it's what's true. Lemmings can be wrong. So I want to break into this answer of Thomas into four different parts and notice that it's personal, that it's comprehensive, that it's exclusive, and that it's very particular. It's personal. Jesus uses this title, I am. And this is one of uh, multiple occasions in John's Gospel where Jesus takes the name of God and uses it for himself. There are at least nine occasions where Jesus does this, probably more. When the Jews heard Jesus using this title, the name of God, I am, for himself, on one occasion, they knew exactly what he was claiming, and so they picked up stones to stone him. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, so they picked up stones to stone him. So Jesus does not say, oh, this is the way, do this, or let me suggest a way, go there, or here is the map of the way, follow that. Jesus says, I am the way. I mean, it's radically and exclusively self-centered. And on its own, this makes Jesus' claim unique. There is quite literally no other like it. If you'd said to Muhammad, are you God incarnate? He would have been absolutely horrified. If you said to Gautama the Buddha, are you God incarnate? You need more enlightenment. Jesus says, I am the way. Furthermore, it's comprehensive. I am the way, the truth, the life. The, the way refers to Jesus opening up the way back to God through his death on the cross. We explored this on Thursday night. I'd encourage you to go online and download the interview and talk. Suffice it to say that, as Angela was suggesting, our rejection of God, placing him on the back burner, ignoring him, mars the relationship between ourselves and God. It causes great offense to him. It distances ourselves from our creator. And in order for the relationship to be restored, for justice to be satisfied, there has to be some means of dealing with the offense that you and I have caused to God. And Jesus says, I am the way on the eve of his crucifixion. I am the way. So Jesus has opened up the way back to God. The keys to heaven are now available through Jesus. The gates of heaven have been thrown open by Jesus. Access to God is now possible through Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms. I am the way. But it's comprehensive, isn't it? I am the way and the truth. This is truth with a capital T. Jesus repeatedly makes this claim of himself. If you remain in me, said Jesus, you will know the truth, capital T, capital T, the truth, and the truth will set you free. For this purpose I was born, and for this reason I've come into the world to testify to the truth 
says Jesus, and anybody who's on the side of the truth listens to my voice. I am the way, the truth, the life. That is, in me, says Jesus, is life. I introduce you to life. Life from God in this world comes from me because I created life. Your next breath, available because Jesus is the life. But also life in the next world from Jesus, I give life with God now and eternity. It's a- and in eternity, it's absolutely comprehensive. I am a divine claim the way, the truth, the life. It's also unavoidably exclusive. Did you spot the negative and then the restrictive? No one comes to the Father except through me. And finally, particular. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. That is, from this moment in time, You know God. From the death and resurrection of Jesus, knowledge of God is available. God has declared his hand. God has revealed himself. From now on, you do know him. Look at the cross. You see God. Now, this is absolute. We can't soft-pedal it without dishonest manipulation. This is unique. No other makes a claim of this sort. And this is exclusive. There is no room for any other when you take that sentence as Jesus said it. And I do realize it's profoundly challenging. I remember reading an interview with Sarah Ferguson, the former wife of uh, Prince Andrew. She was being asked her views on religion, to which she responded, I like to think of God and religion like the way I bake a cake. When I bake a cake, I look around the kitchen and see what ingredients there are in the cupboards, and then I throw them all together and see what comes out. Now, I made a personal note never to accept an invitation to tea with Sarah Ferguson, not that one would ever come. But I wonder if you can see the problem with that. It's the kind of what I call the potato head view of Jesus. Oh, I'll stick an ear on there, and uh, maybe he should have a mustache, and maybe God ought to have a a mouth, and I'll stick it there, uh, and perhaps he's bald, perhaps he isn't. Not only does it fail to take Jesus and all others on their own terms, it's profoundly dishonest. It also kind of sits above Jesus. It's profoundly patronizing. And then you have to ask, well, where is God in the spiritual kitchen as we do our home baking and decide which bit we like and which bit we don't? Uh, Oh, I'm God. It's profoundly arrogant. If God is God, by definition, he can't simply be a kind of pick-and-mix licorice or assortment with me calling the shots. Furthermore, there is absolutely no assurance here. I'm going to be, I think, a little impertinent, and I hope you'll bear with me, but I'm going to ask you to imagine yourself for a moment on your deathbed. It's never a pleasant scene. Breath rasping, lungs rattling, clinging desperately. Where is your assurance? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Do you see, if my assurance is simply with a kind of hodgepodge, pick and mix, potato head, home baking view of God, what, what assurance have you got? As I think about this, I ask myself, could it be that we have too small a view of Jesus, a kind of matchbox view? Could it be too blurred a view of Jesus? We haven't actually got Jesus in focus. Could it be that we have too second-hand a view of Jesus? We've never actually explored his teaching for ourselves. We've just relied on primary school mishmash. Thomas asks, how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, with absolute Assurance, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Now, the more we think about this, the more we explore it, the more what Jesus says stands to reason. I am the way, his crucifixion. You know, he went selflessly and sacrificially to the cross. Nobody else has done that. You know, Muhammad will tell you, oh, you must follow the five pillars. It all depends on you. Gautama, the Buddha, will tell you, you must follow the eightfold path. It all depends on you. The Hindu pantheon will say, you must improve your karma. It all depends on you. The secularist says, you must enjoy life to the full because this is all we've got. And the result is the desperate hamster wheel experience of today. You. But not in a way, also the truth, you know, his revelation, he came. Nobody's actually claimed that. And once he's come as God, the truth is out in the open. The big reveal has happened. It's no longer a mystery, as we've been thinking all morning. And no other has been raised or raised themselves from the dead. I, I, I can take you to the burial place of Gautama, the Buddha, who was cremated at Kushinagar, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we can go to the prophetic chamber in Medina and find the burial place of Muhammad. No other claims, I am the resurrection and has conquered death. So with so many options, how can I choose? One friend of mine puts it like this. If I was to tell you that there was five pence buried somewhere in this building, and 50 million quid buried in the square where I live in South London, where would you go to look first? But then there's also the evidence-based appeal. And I want us to finish here. It's immensely important. We're only going to look at a brief part of Jesus' answer to Philip, which is totally comprehensive. But look at verse 8. Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us, says Philip. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and still you don't know me? I mean, that on its own is extraordinary, isn't it? You don't realize who I am? Come on, Philip, pull your socks up. Time you got past primary school, key stage one. And then the claim, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I am the way and the truth and the life. It's a straight claim to have stepped down from above to his creation in person by Jesus as God. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. It's extraordinary, isn't it? A number of years ago, uh, one of my children at uh, her primary school, they were talking about God in their kind of RE lessons. And the idea was put about that, you know, all views of God are equally true. And very shortly afterwards, I was asked in to do an assembly. I think they sort of thought, well, he's a vicar. We'll palm it off at him. He can deal with it this day. So here we had, you know, 70 to 100 and odd, 9 to 11-year-olds. And uh, so I thought I'd do a bit of an experiment. And I said, I want you to imagine for a moment that I've got a great, great aunt, Ethel. And there was, you know, great mirth. I'm sorry if your names are Ethel, but the nine to 11 year olds thought this was rather funny. Actually, I do have a great, great aunt, Arthur, or aunt uh, Ethel. In fact, I did, is probably the right way of putting it. And uh, um, so I was rather offended. But anyway, a great, great aunt, Ethel. Uh, who in the room thinks my great, great aunt, Ethel, is very, very tall? And, you know, 25% of the hands go up, and so we get, uh, so I got somebody to represent the tall great great aunt. Who in the room thinks my great great aunt Ethel is very, very short? 25%, you know, another person standing here. Who in the middle, in, in the group, thinks she's somewhere in the middle? Another, another group here. And then, now, who in the room thinks my great great aunt, aunt Ethel doesn't exist at all? And there were one or two, you know, very courageous individuals who put their hand up like that. So we got these four representatives. What are you going to make? of me if I tell you that all four of them are right. Now the girls are quite bright and they could do logic and they just fell about laughing. They'd be so ridiculous. Now what are you gonna make of me if I open the door and there is my great great aunt Ethel. Now that would have been something of a miracle but we needn't go into that because she'd be there for a number of years. What are you gonna make of me and there is my great great aunt Ethel and she was to kind of come and stand in here in front of us and I was to say, 
they're all right. Now, there was a slightly stunned silence at that point, particularly amongst the teachers, I may say, and unfortunately, I didn't get asked back to do another assembly for a little while, but it's patently absurd, isn't it? If Jesus' claim is true, and he backs it with evidence, for you and me to go on suggesting that all views of God are equally valid when they suggest profoundly and radically different things about God is patently, logically absurd. You cannot stay there with any intellectual credibility. And so Jesus says to Philip, have I been with you so long, Philip, and still you don't believe? Anybody who has seen me has seen. And then he backs it in the next two verses. Oh, believe me, Believe in the words. Listen to his words. If you don't believe in the words, believe in the works. Look at his works. And so here is the opportunity, you see. I mean, I hope, it, it, you know, to a degree, if I may put it like this, if you had had the sense that all views of God are equally valid, that that ground has been removed as a safe place to stand intellectually and uh, spiritually. It just doesn't work. Then where do I look? The great claim. And now, where do I look in the claim? His words. His works. And I'd love to encourage you to do that. And we heard from, uh, from Paul and Angela the possibility of uh, Christianity Explored. is a wonderful way of exploring the claims of Jesus Christ. I'd love you to do that. If you come to Jesus Christ, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And he gives assurance and confidence and certainty. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 